Okay. Miss. Yeah. Your essay was due today, right? Yeah. Well, last night. Oh, attended in this morning. My bad. It's okay. Okay, we're gonna do something today. Um, it's Halloween time. Ooh. So Halloween. we're gonna read um, a story by Edgar Allan Poe. It's called The Mask of the Red Death. It's my favorite Poe story, just so you know. Uh, I hope you end up liking it as much as I do. Okay. Um, totally forgot to make a slide about Edgar Allan Poe. So let's just take this moment to remind you that the PSAT is on October 29th. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but if you don't know about Edgar Allan Poe, he's what we call an American Gothic writer. He um, wrote a lot of romantic, but not like in a I love you romantic, romantic as in fantastical, um, not literal, not reality um, view of the world. And he wrote this story called The Mask of the Red Death. So before we read it, I want you guys to do a quick write. That's in Google Classroom. And I want you to think about how people today protect themselves from diseases. How do we battle the aging process? Is it possible to avoid diseases and aging entirely? Explain why or why not? So you're going to go to classwork, and we have unit two. That's what we're starting. And I want you to do this question, Mask of the Red Death warm up. So you will select that, and you will type in your answer. Go ahead and do that now. And I thought <laughs> Hey Larry, you are not on mute. Oh, okay. Which is fine. You can not be on mute. You can be out loud. That's fine too. Aww. Okay, let's see who has answered. Two people.
John, I totally agree with your answer. Yeah, Francisco. Very timely right now. So good. Yeah. Okay, I like what you guys are thinking. Good. Lots of stuff about. Go ahead, Isaac. Uh, what does it mean by how do they battle the aging process? Like, how do disease affects older people or like people? Um, kind of a, a different thing. Like, we try to stop from getting sick. Yeah. How do we try to stop from growing old? Oh. Okay, like ointments and stuff or like. Care yeah, for sure. Stuff? That's one thing people do. They drink okay. a lot of water. They use. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, so in looking at your answers, um, I'm seeing a lot of people talk about the stuff we're doing right now because we're in the middle of a pandemic, right? Just, yeah. Right? Um, this, this is the Mask of the Red Death was written, what, 150 years ago, maybe? Um, Dang, that's old. It's, it's pretty old. I mean, Edgar Allan Poe, let's see what I can tell you about him. I've got a whole textbook here that I'll tell us about. Edgar Allan Poe. Not just about him, thank goodness. Yeah, no, this isn't all about him. Um, but he was born in 1809 and he died in 1849. So he died when he was 40. That's five years younger than me. Huh. He, um, so at least, oh, maybe not 150 years old, maybe just 100 years ago, he wrote this. Um, he was a very tortured soul. He's always writing about madness and death, obsession. Um, he had kind of a rough life, and he had a bit of a drug addiction, <laughs> so he won't dwell on that. Um, okay. So, yeah, okay, so let's take a look at our story. First, we gotta talk about some key terms. We're gonna talk about allegory, symbol, character, setting, and object. All right, so. When we study character, there are different ways we get to know our characters. And so I use the acronym called STEAL. That's what the character says what the character thinks, the effect the character has on other people, the character's actions, and the character's looks. So I believe everybody has an interactive notebook. We are going to copy this into the interactive notebook. Look at what I'm doing there. I'm just a mess. I'm going to get these key terms for you from character, and I'm going to copy and paste them in the chat. And then you guys are going to put them into your notebook. So here we go. Okay. Take this and go to your interactive notebook. If you don't know how to get to your interactive notebook, let me help you. You're going to go to your Google Drive. So drive.google.com. Once you're in your drive, you're going to Type in the word interactive. And you should see the pre-AP3 interactive notebook that you made with your own name on it. Do you guys have this? Did we do this? Yes? Okay, great. So you should have one that says. Did you put it about our, like our book that we were Yes, writing? you were. So here is the Miss Richie. Miss. Yeah. You said Google Drive or Google.com? Google Drive. So I do drive.google.com. That's how I get to it. Okay, thank you. I just want the class resources. You can also pull it from your class resources. You can also get to Google Drive by going to your class. But Google Drive is like this big filing cabinet, and any document we write that's a Google Doc gets filed away in that Google Drive, and then we can open that filing cabinet and pull it out later. So here we go. I've got my English 3 interactive notebook, 
and I want to be in the skills setting. So I can do that in a couple of ways. I can scroll down to page six, which is what I'm going to do. Um, and then I'm going to create a text box. All right, and I'm going to do that right here. And in that text box, I am going to paste what I just wrote for you guys in the chat. Now this is a little long, so I'm going to have to change the font on this. And I will do that by, there we go, changing the font size. So now that fits. I might even need to pull it a little bit like this. Okay, and I have steel. What the character says, what the character thinks, and I might, at the very top of it, get the word characterization. If that's what this is. Okay, so you should have an interactive notebook. You can't see what I'm doing. Goodness gracious. There you go. So again, I just made a text box. Pull it down, and then once I was inside the text box, I hit Control V. There it is, and I just had to change the font. So in my font box, I might write 13, and now it fits. I can make it a little bit bigger if I want to. Anybody having trouble with this? Is there anybody who doesn't have the interactive notebook and I need, you need to set up a copy? No. Okay. Okay. So that's one thing I want you to know. That's how we learn about character. Y'all, it's the same way we learn about people. Think about it when you meet somebody new you know pretty quickly if they're going to be your type of person or not based on what they say, how they talk, based on how they look, based on how other people react to them, what other people say about them, how other people behave around them, based on how that character behaves and acts, and based on what that character thinks. I'm a brand new teacher to you guys. You don't know me. But through my words, my actions, um, the way other students react to me, you get an idea of who I am. And the more of those things you learn, the more you know about me and can decide what type of person I am. Does that make sense? You do the same thing with characters and stories. Okay, so that's character. Another thing we're gonna be looking at in this story is setting, all right? So I'm gonna do the same thing with setting that I just did. The setting is more than just the place. That's part of it. There you go. The setting is the place, the location where a story happens. It's also the time of day or the time period. Does it take place in the modern day? Does it take place back in the 1800s? The season, what time of year is it? The geography, am I in the American South? Am I in the Pacific Northwest, like Seattle? Those things are part of the setting as well, okay? So I need to add this to my interactive notebook as well. So here I am, and here's the setting. Okay, so I've got setting, which is the place, the location, the time of day, the time period, the season, and the geography. And on the other side, I have characterization. So both those things should be in your interactive notebook. Okay, Jade, did you put setting in your notebook yet? It's also loaded. Oh, man. No, I'm literally just sitting here waiting with a white screen. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Plan B for Jade. We're planning that. Oh, yeah, she 
I can order something off of Amazon that will turn that into a thing, <laughs> which I will get. All right, how are we doing, guys? You should have steel and you should have satin. Yes? 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 Yeah. Okay, a response. That's wonderful. Okay, next. Symbol. A symbol is a word, an image, an object, anything that represents a larger idea. They are loaded with hidden meaning. So I've got three symbols up here. What is this symbol? You know it. What is it? You can see my cursor, right? Yes, you can. What is, come on, the, the M, what is that? Um, I, it could be monster. I thought for sure you guys would say McDonald's. Does that look like the McDonald's M? Maybe if it was on a red background, I probably did it because it's on a black background. I mean, I, I, I see it. It does look like McDonald's. Jade is saying yes, she sees it now. All right? So, M. Plastic. Okay. This next symbol, if you saw that, would you get closer? Or no, would you? Toxic or right. That is the symbol for biohazard or plague. Right? Stay away. And then we have a whole field. America. Of American flag. It's just a piece of material, but it symbolizes so much more than that. It symbolizes our country. This is why people are getting bent out of shape if somebody disrespects it by taking any, even though that's actually respectful. But it's 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 just material, but it means so much more to Americans. Well, in every country. That flag, your country flag means so much more. Okay. So, as we read the story, the characters, the setting, objects in the story, all of it, they're all symbols, which is what makes this an allegory because everything represents something else. Jade, I have a ghost living in this room. That happens all the time. Okay. I don't know why. Okay, so here we go. We're going to read and annotate the Mask of the Red Death. So let's go to our Google Classroom. English 3. Say, what about annotating? <laughs> they said we're going to annotate it. And I have rules for annotating. So don't hate me, Larry. It's a short story. It's three she pages, and I'm going to read it. So pull up the PDF of the Mask of the Red Death. There's one that looks like, um, you want it to look like this, and you're going to open with Tammy. There's another one that is a chart. Don't, we're not going to do that, that one yet. We're doing the text. So everybody should have their text, and it should look like this. Okay. Grab a sheet of paper if you need to. Jade, I'll write it on the board for you. But when we see characters, we're going to highlight them in pink. Objects are blue. And setting is green. So one more time. Characters are pink 
Objects are blue. Objects are blue. Green. And setting is green. Yeah. Okay. Characters are blue, objects are pink, and setting is green. All right. Now that you have the mask of the red death, I'm going to read this. And as I read it and we come across a character, an object, or a setting, we're going to highlight it and make a comment. Anybody have any questions? If there aren't any questions, let's get started. Yes, you're going to give me a heart attack. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, Mask of the Red Death by Edgar Allan Poe. The Red Death had long devastated the country. No pestilence had ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was its avatar and its seal. The redness and the horror of blood. There were sharp pains and sudden dizziness and then profuse bleeding at the pores with dissolution. The scarlet stains upon the body and especially upon the face of the victim were like the pest ban which shut him out and the aid from the sympathy of his fellow men. Then the whole seizure, progress and termination of the disease were the incidents of a half an hour. What color did you guys see there? Red. Red. So I'm going to make that blue, which is my object. I'm just going to notice that I had a color. Scarlet. Okay. I'm sorry. I need to be marking that. I'm sorry. I need to be in blue. And then scarlet. And then I'm going to add a quick comment that says red. Okay. I hope you guys are with me. That seems significant. I see stuff being repeated. Okay. But the Prince Prospero was happy and dauntless and sagacious. When his domains were half depopulated, he summoned to his presence a thousand hale and light-hearted friends from among the knights and dames of his court. And with these, he retired to the deep seclusion of his castled abbey. This was an extensive and magnificent structure, the creation of the prince's own eccentric yet august taste. The strong and lofty wall girdled it in. This wall had gates of iron. The courtiers, having entered, brought furnaces and massy hammers and wielded the bolts. They resolved to leave the means neither of ingress or egress to the sudden impulses of despair or frenzy from within. The abbey was amply provisioned with such precautions as the countries might bid defiance to contagion. The external world could not take care of itself. In the meantime, it was folly to grieve or to think. The prince had provided all the appliances of pleasure. There were buffoons, there were improvisatories, there were ballet dancers, there were musicians, there was beauty, there was wine. All of these and security were within. Without was the red dust. Where, where is that's a good question, and I'm not sure. Jade is asking why beauty is capitalized. So, beauty could be, I don't think it's a name. I think it's like the personification of all things that are beautiful. There were beautiful people, there was beautiful art. I think it was all there. Could that come from a character of Nazis, then? Yes, it could. One thing I for sure see is this character. And his name is Prince 
cross furrow, right? And I'm highlighting that in pink. I made that a text box. I'm so sorry. What I'm going to do is highlight that in pink. Prince Prospero. He was happy, dauntless, and sagacious. And then I'm going to make a comment. Prospero, what does that sound like? Prosperous, right? Wealthy. Healthy, affluent, rich. Okay. He's happy. He's dauntless. And so what he's doing here, and I've got some objects, so I'm going to switch to blue, is he's taking all of his friends to an abbey, an extensive and magnificent structure. It has gates of iron. There's, it's, it's a place, it's an object. Um, I see what you're saying. It could be a setting, okay? So you can make that green if you want. Either one is fine. And what, is, what they did is they locked themselves in. So I'm going to make a comment about that. It's like a fortress. Why did they do that? Within, there was security. And without, there was the red death. That's the last sentence. So if you can imagine this red death, it's some disease that causes people to bleed and die within 30 minutes. It kills them. So the prince and his friends go to this abbey. You guys with me so far? Yes? Okay. Yeah. All right, good. Okay. It was toward the close of the fifth or sixth month of his seclusion, and while the pestilence raged most furiously abroad, that Prince Prospero entertained his thousand friends at a masked ball of the most unusual magnificence. It was a voluptuous scene, that masquerade. But first, let me tell of the rooms in which it was held. There were seven, an imperial suite. In many palaces, however, such suites form a long and straight vista, while the folding doors slide back nearly to the walls on either hand, so that the view of the whole extent is scarcely impeded. Here, the case was very different, as might have been expected from the Duke's love of the bazaar. His apartments were so irregularly deposed that the vision embraced but little more than one at a time. There was a sharp turn at every 20 or 30 yards, and at each turn a novel effect. The right, left, and middle of each wall, a tall and narrow Gothic window looked out upon the closed corridor which pursued the windings of the street suite. The windows were of stained glass whose color varied in accordance with the prevailing hue of the decorations of the chamber into which it opened. That at the eastern extremity was hung, for example, in blue. And vividly blue were its windows. The second chamber was purple in its ornaments and tapestries. And there, oh, I'm sorry. And here the panes were purple. The third was green throughout, and so were the casements. The fourth was furnished and lighted with orange, the fifth with white, the sixth with violet. The seventh apartment was closely shrouded in black velvet tapestries that hung all over the ceiling and down the wall, falling in heavy folds upon a carpet of the same material and hue. But in this chamber only, the color of the windows failed to correspond with the decoration. The panes here were scarlet, a deep blood color. Now, in no one of the seven apartments was there any lamp or candelabrum. Amid the profusion of the golden ornaments that lay scattered to and fro or depended from the roof, 
There was no light of any kind emanating from lamp or candle within the suite of chambers. But in the corridors that followed the suite, there stood opposite to each window a heavy tripod bearing a brazier of fire that projected its rays through the tinted glass and so glaringly illuminated the room, and thus were produced a multitude of gaudy and fantastic appearances. But in the western or the black chamber, the effect of the firelight that streamed upon the dark hangings throughout the blood to the pain was ghastly in the extreme and produced so wild a look upon the countenance of those who entered that there were few of the company bold enough to set foot within its precincts at all. Okay, so if you can tell what's happening, they're describing the setting of the abbey, of the place where Prince Prosper was having his party. Now normally, these suites, these seven rooms, would be right next to each other. So if you opened all the doors, you could look straight through and you could see every room by color, the blue room and the violet room, right? But Prince Prospero's layout is different. You can only see one room at a time. And those rooms are lit by light coming through stained glass. And that's it. There's no lamp. There's no candles. There's no nothing. The only light is coming through these stained glass. So in each room, it's lit with that color that it is. It'd be like us today doing colored light bulbs. A little weird. Let's look at the color of the room and let's annotate that. So I'm in setting and that means I need to be in green. I'm going to go to my markup, I'm going to select green, and here we go. <clears throat> First, we've got the colors. All right, we have blue and vividly blue word windows. The second chamber was purple. The third was green. The fourth was orange. The fifth was white. The sixth was violet. And the seventh apartment was different. The seventh was black velvet with scarlet windows, right? Well, I'm going to make that note in the comments. Remember, everything in here, everything means something. It's all symbolic. So these colors are going to mean something, right? Each room was a different color. We have one blue. Two, purple, three, four, orange. How can my text go? Five, light, six, violet. And seven was black and red. Okay? I have a theory. Well, Jade has a theory. Let's hear it. Couldn't every color symbolize like a different symptom, symptom I guess, of what the, the, the uh, red death could be? I don't know if you can hear Jade, but she's suggesting that each color represents a different symptom of the red death. Or That's the possible. Order, or that the order you go in. The order you go in. And as I'm looking at these colors too, I'm kind of thinking of like a rainbow. Blue, purple, green, orange, white, but they don't quite go in order. They're not in order, but I would say that they could symbolize for each thing. Like yeah. If blue could cause like, oh, your, your eyes start to water, I don't know. Yes. Yeah, so Jade's thinking about this in terms of symptoms in the red death, which remember, they have lost outside. Okay, the other thing I really want to note is blue, and that's the Gothic windows, okay? The stained glass Gothic windows right there, okay? So 
there we go. We've got that blue stained glass gossip window. Okay. All right. And that last room, just to reiterate what they say, that last room is so weird, nobody even wants to be in there for very long. It freaks everybody out. Okay, let's keep reading. It was in this apartment also that there stood against the western wall a giant clock of ebony. The pendulum swung to and fro with a dull, heavy, monotonous clang. And when the minute hand made the circuit of the face and the hour was to be stricken, there came from the brazen lungs of the clock a sound which was loud and clear and deep and exceedingly musical, but of so peculiar a note and emphasis that at each lapse of the hour, the musicians of the orchestra were constrained to pause momentarily in their performance to hearken the sound. And thus the waltzes perforce ceased their evolutions, and there was a brief disconcert of the whole gay company. And while the chimes of the clock yet rang, it was observed that the giddiest grew pale, and the more aged and sedate passed their hands over their brows as if in confused reverie or meditation. But when the echoes had fully ceased, a light laughter at once prevailed through the assembly, and the musicians looked out at each other and smiled as if their own nervousness and folly had made whispering vows each to the other, the next chiming of the clock should produce them in no similar emotion. And then after the lapse of 60 minutes, which embraced 3,600 seconds of the time that flies, there came yet another chiming of the clock, and there were the same disconcert and tremulous meditation as before. Ooh, another theory. Jade has another theory. Let's hear it. Okay, so... I, I I don't know if this is gonna sound weird, but like they were going to release some form of like plague at a certain hour, but never re refined when it was. Okay. So maybe. it came across as like you were uncertain of what hour it would be, but you knew at some point it was going to be like at like the starting of an hour. So you would project it as okay, is it happening right now? No. Okay, we're safe for today. Maybe. So that clock, Jade is saying, is marking the time and maybe counting down towards something. So every 60 minutes would cause an effect of, is it going to be released right now or am I going to die right now? So death is impending. That is what Jade is picking up there. Okay, a couple of things. That clock is giant and ebony. That means it's black. It's got a pendulum that swings back and forth. It's heavy, it's dull. And then it rings out with this sound that is so bizarre, musical, but bizarre, that everybody stops and has this period of discomfort that Jade is talking about. So for my objects, I've got clock, that pendulum swinging, that sound, I'm going to note some people here. The musicians paused in their performance. The waltzers ceased dancing. The giddiest grew pale. The more aged, sedate, sorry, the more aged and sedate pass their hands over their brows. And then I'm going to note why I highlighted that, okay? The sound causes the musician to stop playing, the dancers to stop. Everybody is nervous. Add into it. For the clock, I'm going to put that the clock seems significant. All right. So I'll give you guys a, a minute to write down those thoughts. We've got people, we've got an object. Okay. 
<laughs> but in spite of these things, it was a gay and magnificent Ravel. The tastes of the Duke were peculiar. He had a fine eye for colors and effects. He disregarded the decora of mere fashion. His plans were bold and fiery, and his conceptions glowed with barbaric luster. There were some who would have thought him mad. His followers felt that he was not. It was necessary to hear and see and touch him to be sure that he was not. He had directed, in great part, the movable embellishments of the Seven Chambers upon the occasion of this great fete. And it was on his own guiding taste which had given character to the masqueraders. Be sure there were grotesque. There was much glare and glittery and piquancy and phantasm, much of what has been since seen in Hernani. There were arabesque figures with unsuited limbs and appointments. There were delirious fancies, such as the madman fashion. There was much of the beautiful, much of the wanton, much of the bizarre, something of the terrible, and not a little of that which might have excited disgust. To and fro in the seven chambers, there stalked, in fact, a multitude of dreams. And in these dreams, rides in and about, taking hue from the rooms and causing the wild music of the orchestra to seem as the echo of their steps. And anon, there strikes the ebony clock, which stands in the hall of the velvet. And then for a moment, all is still, and all is silent, save the voice of the clock. The dreams are stiff, frozen as they stand. But the echoes of the chime die away. They have endured but an instant. And a light, half-subdued laughter floats after them as they depart. And now and again the music swells. And then the dreams live and ride to and fro more merrily than ever, taking hue from the many tinted windows through which they stream the rays from the tripod. But to the chambers which lie most westwardly of the seven, there now comes none of the masters who venture. For the night is waning away, and there flows a ruddier light through the blood-colored pane, and the blackness of this sable drapery, sable drapery appalls, and to him whose foot falls upon the sable carpet, there comes from the near clock of ebony a muffled peal more solemnly emphatic than that which reaches their ears who indulge in the more remoteness gaieties of the other apartments. Okay, so what we're getting here is more setting, it's a scene, it's a party. But this is the second time Poe has mentioned East and West. And the West End, that's where that dark room is. And anybody who's near it, when the clock chimes, those people are affected more than the people at the East End. The further away you are from that room, the happier, the more gaily you party. Gaily as in happy and merry and, and a word as it was intended to be used in the 1800s. So let's take some setting, first let's take some character mix, because we've got some people here. We have figures with unsuited limbs and appointments. So think of like a hunchback or somebody with, like we're about to do Halloween, right? You'll have people with unsuited limbs, you know, like an extra arm or a weird arm that, that's much bigger than the rest of the body. You'll have beautiful, wanton, okay, sorry, I'm not marking that. Figures with unsuited limbs and appointments. You'll have the beautiful, the wanton, the bizarre, the terrible, and some disgust. <laughs> Just like Halloween costumes today. You'll have princesses and fairies. You'll have Freddy Krueger. You'll have all sorts of different stuff out there. Okay? Um, then we have the music swelling, the dreams living. And then, where does he talk about, there we go, the chamber which lies the most westwardly of the seven. Okay. And that seems significant here. The westmost chamber. Um, 
the most um, awful lack of red. Take further to the east, the more fun and relaxed the wings are. And then for my people here, all sorts of costumes, like Halloween. How are we doing, online friends? Amazing, sweetie. How about yourself? <laughs> okay. What happened to Larry? Huh? Did Larry get you? All right. That's okay. We move on. Here we go. But these other apartments were densely crowded, and in them beat feverishly the heart of life. And the revel went whirlingly on until at length there commenced the sounding of midnight among the clocks. And then the music ceased. As I told, and the evolutions of the waltzers were quieted, and there was an uneasy cessation of all things before. But now more of time into the meditations of the thoughtful among those who rebelled, and thus to it happened, perhaps, that there were twelve strokes to be sounded by the bell of the clock. And thus it so happened that more of a thought crept with hat before the last echoes of the last chime had utterly sunk into silence. There were many individuals in the crowd who had found leisure to become aware of the presence of a masked figure which had arrested the attention of no single individual before. And the rumor of this new presence having spread itself whisperingly around, there arose at length from the whole company a buzz or a murmur expressive of disappropriation and surprise and then finally of terror of horror and of disgust. So now I've got a new character and everybody's freaking out. Why do you think people are freaking out that this new guy's there? What did they do with the doors? Hey, Mr. She, Mr. She. <laughs> I break back my tortillas are burning. Okay. What did they do with the doors when they got to the Abbey? You guys remember? Let's scroll out back and I'll tell you. This wall had gates of iron. The courtiers, having entered, brought furnaces and massing hammers and they welded the bolts. So as soon as they got to the Abbey, they locked themselves in. <laughs> Maybe so, Tavo. This is like a horror movie, right? So they locked themselves in, and now all of a sudden, there's somebody else there. If they locked themselves in, that should mean that they locked everybody else out. That's where they got scared. Mm -hmm. So at first, there's just a buzz, like, ooh, who's that? Who's that? And then it's like, wait a second. How did he get here? And what does that mean? In an assembly of phantasms such as I have painted, it may well be supposed that no ordinary appearance could have excited such a sensation. In truth, the masquerade license of the night was nearly unlimited, but the figure in question had outherited Herod and gone beyond the bounds of even the prince's indefinite decorum. There are cords in the hearts of the most reckless which cannot be touched without emotion. Even with the utterly lost to whom life and death are equally just, there are matters which no just can be made. The whole company indeed seem now deeply to feel that the costume and bearing of the stranger Neither wit nor propriety existed. The figure was tall and gaunt and shrouded from head to foot in the habiliment of the grave. The mask which concealed the visage was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse that the closest scrutiny must have had the difficulty in detecting the cheek. And yet all of this might have been endured if not approved by the mad revelers around. 
But the mummer had gone so far as to assume the type of the Red Death. His vesture was dabbled in blood, and his broad brow with all the features of the face was besprinkled with the scarlet horror. So now you get to see the costume of this masked man. The figure was tall and gaunt, shrouded in the outfit of the grave. He looked, yeah, he looked like a corpse. He assumed the red death. He had blood on his face. Right, that's his costume. When the eyes of the Prince Prospero fell upon this spectral image with which a slow and solemn movement as if more fully to sustain its role, it stopped to and fro among the walkers. He was seen to be convulsed in the first moment with a strong shudder, either of terror or distaste, but in the next moment, his brow reddened with rage. Who dare, he demanded hoarsely of the courtiers who stood near him, who dares insult us with this blasphemous mockery? Seize him, unmask him, that we may know whom we have to hang at sunrise from the battlement. It was in the eastern or the blue chamber in which stood the Prince Prospero as he uttered these words, and they sang throughout the seven rooms loudly and clearly, for the prince was a bold and robust man, and the music had become hushed, by the waving of his hand. There's a couple of things here I'm noticing. One is that he is standing in the east room. The second thing I'm noticing is that he is a bold and robust man. That means he's healthy. And strong. Okay. You guys with me? Right. Good. Okay, so just so we've got the setting clear, we've got the prince in the east room. He sees this guy dressed up like the red duck and he's ready to go. He's angry, right? And he's a strong man. It was in the blue room where stood the prince with a group of pale courtiers by his side. At first, as he spoke, there was a slight rushing movement of this group in the direction of the intruder, who at the moment was also near at hand. And now, with a deliberate and stately step, he made a closer approach to the speaker. But from certain nameless awe with which the mad assumption of the mummer had inspired the whole party, there was found none who would put forth a hand to seize him, so that unimpeded, he passed within a yard of the prince's person. And while the vast assembly, as if with one impulse, shrank from the centers of the room to the walls, he made his way uninterruptedly, but with the same solemn and measured step which had distinguished him from the first, from the blue chamber to the purple, through the purple to the green, through the green to the orange, through this again to the white, and even thence to the violet, ere a decided movement had been made to arrest him. It was then, however, that Prince Prospero, maddening with rage and the shame of his own momentary cowardice, rushed hurriedly through the six chambers, while none followed him on account of the deadly terror that had seized upon them all. He bore aloft a drawn dagger and had approached in rapid impetuosity to within three or four feet of the retreating figure, when the latter, having attained the extremity of the velvet apartment, turned suddenly and confronted his pursuer. There is a sharp cry, and the dagger drops gleaming upon the sable carpet upon which instantly afterward fell prostrate in death the Prince Prospero. Then, summoning the wild courage and despair, a throng of the revelers at once threw themselves into the black apartment and seizing the mummer, whose tall figure stood erect and motionless within the shadow of the ebony clock, gasped in unutterable horror at finding the grave mist and corpse-like mask with which they had handled with so violent a rudeness, untenanted by any tangible form. And now it was acknowledged that the presence of the Red Death, he had come like a thief in the night, and one by one dropped the revelers in the blood-bedewed halls of their revels, 
and died each in the despairing prostate prosper of his fall. And the life of the ebony clock went out with that of the last day. And the flames and the tripods expired and darkness and decay and the red death held illimitable dominion over all. Okay, so let's talk about what happens in that last paragraph. We've got some more character stuff. They walk through the six rooms into the last one. Prospero, angry with rage and shame at his cowardness. He gets the dagger. He's ready to stab him and instantly falls dead. I am not marking this up. I'm sorry. He instantly falls dead. He's maddening with rage and the shame of his cowardness. Then we have the mummer, the masked guy, right? His tall figure stood motionless within the shadow of the ebony clock. It was empty when they grabbed his costume and his mask. There was nothing there. So let me make that comment. Here, I'm going to put that Prospero died instantly. That seems significant. And then the last thing I'm going to do is this setting, right? He made his way all the way through. east to west. And then finally, everybody dies. All right. So what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to fill out the symbol chart that's also in this camp. So when you're done with this, you can save it and turn it in. In Cami, in your Google Classroom, sorry, you have the Mask of the Red Death symbol PDF. And here, you can open this with Cami, and you can fill it in. So I'll do one for you guys, and then I'll let you guys work on this part yourself. Who are the important character settings or objects? Well, for me, one of the important objects for sure is the ebony clock. Okay. What does that clock symbolize? The passing of time, maybe? Why is it important? I would say the party goers get closer and closer to death. So that's what I would put for one of them. The ebony clock, it's the passing of time. That was me and my desk. Mm -hmm. And as time passes, the party goers get closer and closer to death. I'm going to let you guys fill this chart out and submit it. And we're actually going to talk a little bit more about this story in the next class period. So if you've got questions, go ahead.